what what it what it gave me was an ability or a chance to understand how bad I had lived before because with the pancreas how I felt I realized that I had felt very very poorly for a long period of time and I had just grown accustomed to it that was what I felt was normal you know the the feeling of your skin being too tight the feeling of fear when your blood sugar goes low the uh, feeling of irritability and headaches and and the 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 fear of uh, complications and and the constant management of of uh, insulin injections versus blood sugar measurements and the food intake and the the stress it all puts on you all that was suddenly gone that was dr karen heenberger and this is the bravest podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 20 of The Bravest Podcast. On today's show, we have Dr. Karen Heenberger. Now, some of you might know her from her amazing work with her venture, which is called Lifebulb. But for those of you who are not familiar with her, Dr. Heenberger is a type 1 diabetic who is no longer a type 1 diabetic. That's right, she is an XT1D. Now, I'm not talking about some miraculous transformation or some miracle drug that revived her failing pancreas. She really has an amazing story, and once we get about halfway through our conversation, I promise you this will all make much more sense. But just to give you some perspective, Dr. Heenberger has a list of credentials and professional accomplishments that make her the definition of a multi-hyphenate. She was on the Swedish national tennis team. She earned her medical doctorate and her PhD in molecular medicine. She was a postdoc fellow at Harvard, a consultant for McKinsey & Company, and she's worked in big pharma as well as startup biotech companies, and the list goes on and on. Now, what's remarkable about her story is that she navigated all of those challenging environments and really succeeded on a large scale, all with type 1 diabetes. But as the years went on and a period of significant burnout and poor control of her health set in, all of the complications anyone with diabetes fears started to kick in for her. Now, Dr. Heenberger ultimately found herself with significant damage to her vision, her kidneys were failing, and she was really on the edge of complete physical breakdown. Now, ultimately, it was her father who saved her life with an incredible gift, and then just a few months later, it was a donor and a very talented transplant team in Minnesota who would provide Dr. Heenberger with a chance to experience life without type 1 diabetes again. Now, she is the ultimate patient entrepreneur, and we learned through this interview that she is all in when it comes to finding and supporting the next generation of budding patient entrepreneurs. In fact, as I release this episode, Dr. Heenberger and her team are over in Denmark for this year's Lifebulb Novo Nordisk Innovation Summit, where they'll be working with some of the best young innovators in the world of diabetes. Now, there's a lot to this story, and our conversation is a deep look into topics like denial, into motivation, and a belief that those impacted by a chronic condition really should be at the center of creating ventures that help minimize the impact of that condition on the world as a whole. So this is a super interesting episode. I really enjoyed speaking with her. But before we get into the show... I hope you guys have had a chance to check out my friends over at the apparel company Greater Than. Now, if you've listened to episode 19 of the show, you heard all about Stephen and Jen Kramer and their son, Hayden. So Greater Than was inspired by Hayden's recent diagnosis with type 1 diabetes. And because of that diagnosis, the Kramers wanted to throw all of their energy into making an impact on the world in some way. Now, the result is their apparel company that they call Greater Than. And their purpose is to let all of us know that we are all greater than any challenges that we might encounter. Now, for their first line of apparel, it includes things like baseball hats and t-shirts, and a portion of all the profits go directly to support diabetes research. In fact, they announced just last month 
that they'll be don- donating directly to the research lab of Dr. Denise Faustman, who's up at Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, their products are really amazing. And if you go over to www.imgreaterthan.com and you purchase something from the site, not only will you get some cool gear, but you're also doing your part to support an amazing team of diabetes researchers. So head on over to www.imgreaterthan.com and make sure, and this is something that Stephen and Jen are doing just for listeners of my show, make sure that you use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. So that's imgreaterthan.com. Use the code BRAVEST at checkout. You'll get 10% off your entire order, and you'll also be doing your part to support some amazing research in the lab of Dr. Denise Faustman. All right, guys, that's all I've got for now. Let's jump into my conversation with Dr. Karin Heenberger. So, Dr. Heenberger, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. We're in the middle of New York City in your beautiful office here in the Life Bulb offices in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, I'm really excited to have you here. So I just want to say thank you so much for spending the time with me today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure be, to be here. Awesome. So, so we recently came to know each other. Um, and the listeners who are with us today will, will understand shortly why I'm so excited to have you on the show. But... Just to give the audience a quick kind of 10,000 foot view, that's the very venture capital way of talking, right? It's the 10,000 foot view and then we'll kind of zoom in. Um, Why I'm so excited to have you here. Um, You grew up in Sweden. You were on the Swedish national tennis team. You earned your MD and your PhD in molecular medicine from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. You completed your postdoctoral work as a JDRF fellow at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center at Harvard Medical School. You worked for McKinsey and Company at the start of your professional career. You were on the senior management teams of a handful of biotech companies, some of which you helped take public. And to top that all off, you're the founder of the independent think, uh, think tank and kind of venture cat- catalyst called Lifebulb, which is here in New York City, which is designed to support this concept of the patient entrepreneur, which we'll really get into a lot throughout our conversation today. So what I got through your entire bio is that you are a massive underachiever. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I actually like how you uh, called us venture catalysts. That's, that's, I've never heard that before. Uh, it's, it's an interesting way of positioning it. But uh, yes, I, I, I've always tried to accomplish uh, things. Not, uh, uh, you know, I have, a, 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 I think, a, a pretty strong drive ever since I was a little baby. Uh, and um, it's something you're born with. And I think also was uh, probably exacerbated by my diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Because yeah. I felt my time was in some ways borrowed. And I had to really accomplish a lot of things in a short period of time. Well, you've definitely done that. And I know there's so much more on the horizon, which we're going to talk a lot about throughout the course of our conversation today. But before we kind of get into the details of Lifebulb and what you're doing from, a, from that venture catalyst perspective, I want to rewind the hands of time a little bit and kind of zoom in the lens just a bit as well. I mentioned that you're originally from Sweden, and I'm curious to understand, and I asked this question of, of pretty much every one of my guests, what was childhood like for you in Sweden? I had a, a, a very, uh, I think, stimulating childhood, uh, you know, great parents, uh, pretty young parents, uh, if you compare it nowadays. Uh, my parents were, uh, uh, they met in university, so they were both students uh, at the time, and uh, I was the first child, so I was... Uh, you know, the most uh, interesting uh, activity of their lives at that time, I was really the highlight. And if I look back at photos and, uh, and movies and, uh, you know, what, what they did, they, they spent their time uh, raising me and they were fascinated by that, which I guess puts a lot of pressure on, on me <laughs> as well, being, uh, being the center. But it was, uh, I can't complain. They were wonderful parents. Were they academics uh, as well? Yeah, they were academics. My, my father uh, was a quantum chemist, so he was very um, uh, mathematical, physics, chemistry. And uh, my mother being on the opposite spectrum, really, in languages, in art, in aesthetics, um, history. And uh, they met uh, in Uppsala in uh, Sweden, 
my um, uh, my, mo- my father three years older than my mother, and uh, they um, they uh, very quickly fell in love and and got married and had me. So and then I had um, they had a second child three years later, uh, my sister who's in Barcelona now, and um, uh, I think uh, the two of us grew up very very nicely together. Um, I was always. Um, highly highly high, very high energy as a child i was not sitting still i was moving i was jumping i was running and uh, uh my parents said that just uh, happened from the beginning and um I was also incredibly interested in learning, and they they stimulated that a lot. I mean, there was uh, always activities in our uh, in my childhood. We would always go to museums, borrow books. We would uh, go and visit different sites. Um, we never really sat back and uh, and just relaxed. I don't remember that uh, at all. There was always an activity planned um, by both parents, and um, I think that that was very very good for us. But it also maybe uh, haven't really learned how to to relax I only relax when I'm tired when I'm really exhausted so um, that that was really my upbringing but but again learning and and sports were what we did yeah. um, and uh, very early on I was um, uh, I started out doing gymnastics because that was uh, that was my biggest interest as a little child I was jumping and uh, walking on bars and um, uh, they put me into gymnastics class when I was two to three years old and I started uh, pretty intensively everything I did I did with high intensity I I didn't do five different things I did one thing and I did it a lot so I started with gymnastics and then I moved into track and field and then tennis yeah so it sounds like you had this this very interesting conglomerate of this right brain left brain world with your mom and your dad yeah very analytical very scientific and then also very artistic in many ways from your mom Mm -hmm. Um, the sports when, when you got involved in sports was there a purpose for you was there a mission or was it just because you had all this energy and these were things that you enjoyed doing oh there was a purpose I, I, I mean it was something I enjoyed I really wanted to do sports that was always my 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 I, I enjoyed it so much it was what I did in my free time but there was a purpose I didn't do sports just because I wanted to have fun I did sports because I wanted to win uh, there was clearly not something I did for pleasure. And I don't think my parents put me in sports either because it was for pleasure. I think they, they, they thought it was very good for me. It's interesting they, because you say you did it with, with purpose because it, it, that carries over so much into your adult life in terms of the competitiveness. Because yeah. when we talk about your business life, when we talk about what you're doing with Lifebulb, there's competition embedded in that left and right. Um, so we're definitely going to talk about that. So maybe you can share with me a little bit about um, influences. Who were the biggest influences in your life when you were a child? Outside of your parents, maybe. My grandparents. Uh, my my grandmother was uh, a great athlete. I mean, she was a gymnast and uh, she was a, a, a great competitor. And uh, uh, so she was a great influence on, on me. I wanted to be... Uh, like her in some ways. Um, my grandfather, her husband, was also a great athlete. Um, and he uh, he was uh, very, very strict, very, very tough. I mean, the two of them were, were tough grandparents. On my other side, my mother's side, the grandparents were incredibly nice. I mean, they were just very sweet. And they always would say to my parents, you know, she needs to relax a little bit. She needs to do things just for fun. And I, I think I, 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 I didn't really understand what that was. For me, if I did something, I did it with purpose. It was, uh, in, I enjoyed it when I did it well. I didn't really enjoy things if I didn't do it w- do them well. Um, and I think that's how I was raised. And, and but not not I wouldn't blame it on my parents. I think that's how I was as an individual. I I, I recently saw um, a movie, you know, from from the, the you know the seventies because that's when I grew up uh, in Sweden. It was one of those super eight movies that my my dad showed in you know, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. And I saw as a little kid, I mean, two years old, I was already, you know, running and, you know, trying to get ahead with my little friends. So I think I had that spirit. I was always happy. So it wasn't something I did because I I made, didn't make me unhappy. I wasn't forced to do anything. I was smiling. I was laughing. I was never sick. I, I never had got a flu or a cold or a stomach ache. I seemed to be smiling and laughing most of the time, but always, you know, doing something. 
Super I wasn't self-motivated, it seems very like. Very self-motivated. Yeah. No one needed to push me to do anything. I mean, never. It was always my... And I was always very critical as yeah. well of myself. So you took that competitive spirit and, and you went into tennis, which became a huge passion for you at that point in, in your life. And mm-hmm. you ended up going on to to compete as part of the, the Swedish national team as well. Um, what I understand, and this will kind of roll a little bit into your diagnosis story because you weren't clearly di- type one diabetes wasn't a part of your life as a young child necessarily, but there was a particular episode where you were embedded in this comp- this heavy competition from what I read, um, where you weren't feeling too well, um, but you did very well competitively. And that's probably that competitive spirit. Maybe you could talk to me a little bit about that period of time and how that rolled into your diagnosis with type one. Yeah, it was a very tough year for me, actually, that that whole year when I, I was diagnosed, because I had um, I had been uh, chosen to go into a so-called tennis high school in Sweden. When you when you go into high school, I was uh, 15, 16, and um, uh, I decided that instead of going to regular high school, I was going to I went to this tennis high school, which meant that you played tennis four hours a day and you did sports and and you and, and you also studied Um and it was far away from where my my family was. I had to move away from home. And but un, in an unlucky way, and maybe it had to do with diabetes. I I got injured very very badly injured. I had a um, kind of tendonitis in my in my wrist, and I couldn't play. I couldn't play for several months at all. And I I think back, and I think that maybe the the the, the diagnosis of diabetes would happened about nine months or twelve months later maybe impacted the healing and and this this uh, injury that i had because my body was breaking down so um, after three months of not being able to play and not really going uh to school sufficiently because it was a tennis school i decided together with my parents that i was going to move back home and start regular high school because this this wasn't working out i didn't want to sit alone far away and not even play tennis and not get up the, the best education I could get. So I moved back home and I had missed three months of um, uh, the beginning of high school, which is when you move very fast. I mean, in contrast, maybe to middle school or junior high, you move very fast in three months. Uh, so I had to catch up with my with my peers. And that was hard because I'd always been very good at school. And then suddenly I was sitting and I had, had to catch up. So it was a tough time for me. And I still was injured. So I had to come back from the injury and also come back in school. And it put a lot of pressure on me that I hadn't had before. Uh, but within um, five, six months or so, I was kind of back in school. And my injury had slowly been healing. Um, and I was start, I was playing again. And I was going to full-time school. But within a period of four, four, three months, I think it was about three months, I had tonsillitis three times. Hmm really uh, bad tonsillitis, uh, which needed antibiotic treatment. And again, I think this was clearly the beginning of the diagnosis because my body was now weak. And plus, it could have been a trigger of the, the final destruction of the beta cells. Sure. You know, I was clearly in this uh, uh, insulitis time where my pancre- pancreatic cells were declining and that additional injury based on the the uh, the uh, tonsillitis probably killed the rest of them so that summer uh, a year after i had started um, uh, the tennis school i was playing in a big tournament in the southern part of sweden um, and uh, i was not feeling well i was really not feeling well i was uh, i'd lost weight you know quite dramatically quite quickly about 10 kilos, which is a lot, um, on me, um, who was always a very strong, I mean, athlete, never, never in any way overweight. Uh, so I was very lean and I had, I was drinking so much and I woke up several times uh, a night and had to go to the bathroom. All the symptoms of diabetes that we all know so very well, sure. but I didn't know them. My family didn't know them. And despite being educated, we really didn't know these symptoms and we just thought something was wrong. But I was playing in the tournament and I played well, but I had cramps every single match. I had leg cramps because I was so dehydrated. Mm -hmm. I was probably in, 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 had ketones. I mean, I was in bad shape, but I pushed through and then I, I got, I reached the final and lost in the final and then I, I felt so weak that my parents said, instead of going back to Stockholm where we lived, I was going to go back up to see my grandparents, the nice ones, <laughs> not the tough ones, and stay with them for a week or so and just really take it easy. Because 
what also happened that summer was that my whole family was moving to Paris. So we're moving to Paris and I was starting a new school and um, a lot uh, of stressful events all at once. A lot of stressful events. So as soon as I got up to the northern part of Sweden where my grandparents were uh, relaxing, they within a day said, we think you have diabetes. What made them think that though? They had a neighbor uh, who had diabetes, a child. And they, for some reason, they, 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 they knew this. They were not doctors, but they, 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 they seemed to understand that. First of all, they understood something was wrong. I looked sick. Sure. And, and I was drinking so much and, you know, all that. And um, so they, um, uh, they took me to the, the closest uh, little uh, clinic that uh, was close to this place. It's a cabin in the forest. I mean, very primitive, uh, very Spartan, where their country house is, very beautiful, but uh, not exactly in the, uh, with, bi- with a big hospital close by. So we went to the clinic and um, they did a urine test and it was sky high. I mean, it was ketones and it was very, it was sugar in my urine. So immediately the nurse, there was not even a doctor there, said you have to go to um, the big hospital, which is about uh, 45 minutes away. So we went there and they immediately admitted me type 1 diabetes and um, started me on insulin IV. Um, what and were you thinking at that point? Was that something I that didn't think it was real. I really didn't believe it. I thought this was a complete something wrong. This could not be happening to me. I really didn't believe the diagnosis. So denial set in at Complete that point. denial. And, uh, and they, I mean, I was in the hospital overnight and I remember that night in, and waiting for my parents to, to, to come from, uh, from Stockholm and they came and I still remember lying in that bed. It was the first time I'd been in the hospital and they walk in, the two of them, and my father was very, uh, serious and my mother was just crying and, um, uh, they walked in and, um, I realized uh, I was very, uh, I, I had, a, I had something that, uh, I couldn't imagine that I would, would, uh, would have, uh, and I still didn't believe it. I still thought, you know, this pancreas needs to kick in at some point. Um, and uh, I remember the nurse uh, telling me, uh, one of the nurses there, she said, you know, you're very lucky to be diagnosed now. If you'd been diagnosed uh, 70 years earlier, you would have been dead. That's kind of a backhanded... Uh, oh, it was bad. I passed out. I, it was the first time in my life that I passed out. And I passed out when she said that because I was standing up when, when she was trying to show me how to inject insulin. And she said, you're very lucky to be getting this insulin because 70 years ago, you wouldn't have had it. Um, there was no insulin. And, and I, it was just a terrible thing to say to a 16-year-old person who is, uh, first of all, also physically very sick. Sure. I mean, I was in, in I had ketones. I was in, uh, you know, I was acidic. And, and, uh, and here I am um, very weak. And she's telling me I could have been dead. I would have been dead. Yeah, it's the last thing that you want to hear. You, you, you're in, at this point, you're kind of in denial about the whole thing, and she's she's explaining to you how lucky she believes that you are. Yeah. Which you know, uh, cl- clearly she's trying to be helpful, but it, it didn't come off that way, especially to to your mind at that point. The denial part of this is interesting to me too, because um, it seems as though, um, again, based on some research that I've done on you, is that for a period of time you actually. Um, made a conscious effort to keep your diagnosis with, with type one very private, only telling the people who were kind of in your immediate circle. What was the reason for that? Well, I, I, I realized at that time when I was in this hospital that this was cha- this was, there was a change. I mean, this was a big change for me and I, I didn't want it to come across as that to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, obviously my parents were there and, and my father, uh, again, the m- very mathematical, he just sat down with me, we're going to document everything, we're going to, you know, deal with this. And my mother said, we're going to change uh, every diet and we're going to eat well and uh, you're going to be fine. Uh, but I was reading about the complications and I was reading about how this impact my life and how I couldn't, uh, you know, become a truck driver if I wanted to and I couldn't be diving if I wanted to. Was All truck those... driver on the list of occupations for you? Yeah, c- c- completely not, <laughs> you know, but but I just saw all these different things that I couldn't do and I had never, I mean, that was one thing with my parents. They 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 made it seem when I was a child that I could do anything. There was no restriction, and I I, w- I never felt that I was a girl or you know I couldn't do things that boys could do. I was always competing against the boys if I you know in school or in sports. I mean I was 16, so I was beginning to lose against the boys. I mean, but but I 
I I had never seen it. I had never felt as bad as I had that day because I realized that there were things that I could not do. And I thought to that point, I had believed that I could do anything. So it totally shifted your mindset at that point in time. That was kind of a tipping point. It for was you. a huge tipping point. I mean, if 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 you if you, if I think back now on what what was my idol? I mean, what I, I really looked up to. I mean, there's a Swedish children's author called Astrid Lindgren who wrote a book about a little girl with the red pigtails called Pippi Longstocking. Of course, yeah. And Pippi Longstocking was clearly my idol. I mean, she was the strongest girl in the world. She could beat up all the pirates, and uh, she had uh, she lived by herself uh, with her monkey and her. You know, she 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 was the best and she really had no no problems defeating anyone and I kind of felt that I could be like Pippi Longstocking and but when I got diabetes I felt I couldn't even become a truck driver I could not dive I could not do this or that and and that that was it was really um very very negative for me so I said to my parents okay we're gonna and I was very uh, serious about it we're not gonna tell anyone we're gonna make sure this is dealt with within the family and um, I will take care of myself, but I don't want anyone else to know. And especially since we were moving to Paris and uh, we were, I was going into a new school, um, I, I really didn't want anyone there to know. And I kind of cut with my uh, situation in Sweden, this, the school and my tennis. I didn't really look back uh, because I thought maybe there will be rumors about this, even though I wasn't telling anyone because maybe people will find out. So I don't need to talk to them anymore. So it was a very clear cut. I mean, I've re, uh, gone back now and I, 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 I'm now uh, very friendly with the people that I, I left at that time. And, but I, I just didn't want to have a conversation with them. Uh, yeah. So it was a very strange. Uh, it was very strange. I mean, it took me 18 years to talk about it. Challenging, yeah. challenging. So, so it's interesting though because you kind of took that as much as you saw it as a as a limitation to a certain extent. You ultimately took that diagnosis and it kind of flipped you onto a different path, where you ended up um, kind of using that diagnosis to dive headfirst into the healthcare world, into the world of medicine, into research. So ultimately, you end up graduating top of your class. You're accepted into this prestigious medical school. Um, what, what, what kind of drove you into, uh, yes, the diagnosis drove you into the medical profession, but was there something else that kind of was a calling into that world? Well, I would say the medical profession I was interested in even as a little girl. I mean, I was always very intrigued by, by medicine. I think I would have gone into medicine with or without diabetes, gotcha. um, but uh, to study diabetes was clearly something that I I I um, um, I was driven to because of my diagnosis. But again, when I was little, um, I would I would read about uh, you know scientists. I would read about um, uh, Pasteur, Marie Curie. I mean, I had idols that no other little girl had. I mean, it was strange. I combined, you know, my interest in sports with an interest in curing disease. And, and finding solutions to disease. Uh, that, was, that was something I was really interested in. I would, I would be studying like little animals and thinking about, you know, why are snails hermaphrodites and how, how, how are the frogs, uh, you know, how, how are things built? So I, I was, had no interest in mechanics, no interest in looking at um, little cars or, or engines, but I had a huge interest in the human body, uh, in biology. So that, that was something I was fascinated uh, by. But when I was diagnosed, it made me push harder. It made me want to be better. It made me really want to show everyone that I could do what I had intended to do, but to do it faster and to do it better and to be you know, not restricted by this. So I think that, that really uh, changed. It wasn't until much later that I decided that I'm going to use my own experiences with diabetes to be a better healthcare professional or to be a better venture capitalist or be a better venture catalyst, as you call it. Um, that didn't happen until much later. And it also didn't happen until much later that I realized that I, I needed to be um, 
I needed to reach out to others and I needed to, uh, to uh, not only help others through my education and my insights based on, on science or business, but I also can help others based on my insights and my own experiences. Of course, yeah, which is probably even more powerful in many cases. Especially when you, if you can combine them, yeah, absolutely. I think much more powerful. Yeah, so so going through medical school, going through your doctoral studies, that clearly entails very long hours, high levels of stress, lack of sleep, all these things that are are critical for us to lead a healthy and happy lifestyle. But we know for a period of time, especially as medical students, our our health takes a back seat, which is ironic because we're trying to help the rest of the world maintain their own health. How did you manage all of that with kind of the minute-to-minute day-to-day attention that diabetes required? I think it actually helped me. It, it, it helped me in a way. First, I think my tennis and my sports um, background really helped me with medical school because I, I didn't, I never did things last minute. I was always prepared and I, I was very, um, very good at time management uh, in school. Um, I, um, I, 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 I have an ability to learn quickly so I can read something and remember and I'm good at taking tests. Uh, so that, that was helpful. But, but I also was incredibly focused and disciplined um, and, and driven by both my experience in sports but also because of diabetes, I think. You know, I, I, I learned that my body needs a certain, uh, certain fuel. It needs to be managed and uh, if I can take care of that, then I can do better as a student as well. So I would argue that my time as a student and my time in the beginning with, uh, with um, my disease, um, it actually helped me very much to excel in school and to do better because I, didn't, I couldn't take things for granted in, in the same way that maybe others could. I mean, from an early age, I had to manage my time because I was doing so much outside of school that if, um, you know, most people would come back from school and have several hours to play with, uh, I only maybe had half an hour because I was playing tennis. So I knew that during that time, I have to really complete what I, what I needed to do. And then you add on diabetes, it, it becomes even more uh, of a hurdle. But it also made my life incredibly uh, structured yeah. and rigorous. So I was controlled you know, very controlled as a person. You know, during my uh, baccalaureate time, when I, in, in, in my school, you had the final exams to, to get a final grade. You know, I, I did not mess with my, with my time. Uh, and if I had to be uh, almost rude to my, my family or rude to my, my, my person, or not prioritize my personal life, I didn't care. I was brutal in, in what I needed to accomplish. And that really changed over time. But uh, during the first, I would say, 10 years with diabetes, I was incredibly disciplined. And I wouldn't put anything into my mouth that was bad for me. I mean, I would be checking every single thing on labels. And if I didn't have, la- if there were no labels, I would try to look it up. And it created a, um, a I think, um, a picture of me to others, including my family, that I mean, not hostile, but very cold uh, as a person because I never let go. I never relaxed. It became even tenser than I was before. That's interesting. So you said for 10 years you were super structured yeah. and this kind of, this way of being was very solid in your, in your, in your life. But I want to talk to talk about just in a little while is, is the breakdown of that structure because there was a period of time where that actually broke down a little bit for you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll talk about that just in a little in a little bit because I, w- I do want to talk about burnout because I think burnout is a very real phenomenon that we all experience, whether it's diabetes or anything else in our life. Burnout is a very real experience. Um, so so after you completed all your ac- kind of academic requirements, you go on to Harvard. You're there for your postdoc. You're doing some really interesting research as a JDRF fellow there. Um, Seems as though you're on, on this solid track to become this academic clinician, at least from an outsider looking in. <clears throat> but you ultimately landed in the world of business. It's not if looking at someone who's kind of been involved in that world just on the periphery. I understand it's not that far of a jump necessarily because there's a lot of scientists and physicians that ultimately end up in the business world. But for you in particular, what caused that shift? Again, that's another shift in your life. Mm-hmm. But what caused that shift from kind of this academic world, which is very research-based, into now you're going into the business world? 
Well, I think that for me, when I was in medical school and when I was doing my PhD, I, I did it with a certain end goal in mind. My end goal was I was going to get my degrees and I finished a project. And when I started this career of uh, the postdoc and then thinking about becoming a clinician, it seemed endless. Yeah. It seemed like a really long path of doing very similar things. And I, I didn't really, s I, 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 I didn't see myself doing that. Um, so even, even when I accepted the position at Harvard, I saw that as a huge um, opportunity and something that I really, uh, uh, the, the, the topic was, was very interesting and the place was incredibly stimulating. But I didn't enjoy it in the same way as I had enjoyed my, my time at the Karolinska. And that was the point when things started breaking down for me also with my control. The moment I moved to Boston from Stockholm and I suddenly had a new group of uh, individuals I had to interact with, friends and colleagues and, uh, uh, you know, losing a little bit my, my footing where I had been and, and, and uh, my personal life, um, I, I, I suddenly let go of some of that control. And I started to have a kind of a late stage rebellion in a sense that I... I I didn't want to be a patient anymore. I really didn't want to be measuring my blood sugar all the time. I didn't want to regulate my my uh, intake of insulin versus what I, I my food and and also I didn't see that the next few years were going to lead to something that made me feel oh this is the next step in my career. Um, so. So I, I, that was a tough year for me. Um, I spent one year there and I, uh, I accomplished a lot um, and I learned a lot, but I, I did not enjoy it as much as I had in the past. And I knew very quickly that I wanted to do something very different with the rest of my life. Didn't know exactly what, but I, I knew that I really liked challenges. I liked goals that I set for myself. And um, I liked, uh, uh, I love healthcare. I mean, it's just medicine to me is what I, I can do, you know, all day, all night. I can read about it. I can try to, to, to uh, I, 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 it, it, it's something that never gets boring for me. But when I was in the lab at Harvard, it felt more like I was, I was doing very small, a very small project in the whole of medicine instead of addressing the really big challenges. So uh, when you become an academician and especially a, a researcher in a specific area, you have to specialize and do something that you become very, very strong at. And I think I had done that for my PhD, but I, I felt that now was the time to broaden. Um, and, and since I wasn't ready to go into the clinic and treat patients, I saw the, the opportunity of the business uh, where I could address big needs and also try to solve problems, but use my uh, knowledge in medicine and learn more and more as a very big opportunity. So I looked at venture capital, I looked at um, uh, pharmaceutical in, in the pharmaceutical industry, biotechnology, and I felt that I am so naive in this, in this space, I don't know much at all, that uh, it felt like I needed to test a few different things. And consulting seemed like something where I really could get exposure uh, among a very strong group of people, because that was also something. I really enjoyed the interaction with people. And the more time I spent in the lab, the less I felt that I was interacting with people and I was just doing my own research with maybe a few of them. I got time. very isolated, more isolated than I had when I was in medical school and also doing my PhD. So I felt that being in a great group of individuals from various different backgrounds uh, would be very stimulating. And then I would also get insights into the pharma biotech industry and, and learn much more what that was about. So it felt like for me, consulting was the next level of education more than a job. Yeah, and then you took that education, you ended up going into big pharma, ultimately into smaller biotechs and using that not, not only academic uh, background of yours and that research background and that medical background, but also this consulting background where you're pulling information from all these different parts of the world and different parts of your brain, essentially, to uh, help build these companies from nothing into substantial entities. So that's a whole other uh, uh, educational experience unto itself that you don't get unless you're in that particular environment. You can't read about that in a book necessarily. Um, so, so you talked a little bit 
uh, just a, a few moments ago about this concept of burning out and kind of this late stage rebellion that you went through. Um, so after some kind of some time climbing the ladder in the business world um, and, and accomplishing all these amazing things in business and finance, you mentioned that things started to kind of fall apart a little bit for you in terms of a health perspective. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't, I, 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 I mean, it wasn't apparent from the outside. Uh, I, I didn't look sick. I, yeah. I looked healthy. Um, I, I didn't seem, I think, uh, tired or I didn't seem weak. But I was feeling very limited in my energy level. I mean, it, it, uh, if I had been controlled in the past and, and really uh, uh, focused, I, I still seemed controlled and focused. But here it was also because my energy was limited. I could not, I, I, I was controlling and I was, I, was, I was focusing much because otherwise I wouldn't have the energy. And I felt that I was, I was getting sick. I so was you getting were compensating sick. because you knew that there were some limitations in terms of what you can, your output could be. Right. Right. And I was removing, um, my, uh, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't limiting my work. Uh, really, I was limiting some of my, uh, energy that I could spend on people that were not important for my career. Uh, which is a very selfish and uh, and horrible way of being, but but that that was how I was for a period of time. I mean, I was working very hard, and I was working with people who were very competitive, and I wanted to stay competitive, but I also felt that my my body was not allowing me to to do all the things that I wanted to do. Um, and um, uh, that's hard to realize when you're, you know, in your late twenties. Uh, so I, I felt that now is the time when I should be at my strongest. Uh, but since no one, no one knew I had diabetes, uh, no one accommodated for for me, uh, and that was really the way I wanted it. I didn't want it to be accommodated for at all. Uh, that that was that was never on the table. But um, I, I instead of maybe saying to people, "Well, I'm tired and I need a rest." I would just uh, eliminate, for example, dinners, or I would eliminate interaction with friends, and I would cancel. I would cancel a lot and reschedule a lot. And, uh, you know, that affected um, clearly uh, relationships. It affected, uh, you know, how I dealt with my family, because they will always be there. You know, the people who, who love me uh, and, and, I, and, and who I love, I mean, I, are, are going to be the ones that maybe are, the, are hurt the most in a situation like that. Because um, I, I can't behave in the same way with, with, with people who I, I don't know as well as, as, as those I know well. That's um, usually the case, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, I I, uh, I I tried very hard, and I I think what 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 was the what was the case was that I started to realize that in the beginning with diabetes, my my attitude was I'm going to do better because I'm going to be so controlled that this disease is never going to affect me, and my A1C was between four to six. It was so tightly controlled. I I didn't have any signs of complications. Um, I was in perfect shape, and then. I, I just said, I can't be living a life like this where I have no freedom, where I'm constantly thinking about, uh, you know, being in control. Um, and, and instead, I'm going to do the best I can and the most I can, but I know it's not going to last. So I knew my life would not last. I, I never thought that I would live beyond 30 you know, during those years. I thought, I'm going to push very hard. I'm going to do as much as I can, and I know it's going to end. Uh, but I was fine with that because I wasn't willing to live a life that was so controlled again. Um, and it seemed like things would worked out anyway. I mean, I, I passed 30 and I continued to drive very hard. And it wasn't until uh, 2007, so I was 34, uh, that um, it suddenly collapsed. It collapsed dramatically. Until then, I knew, I mean, I may have known that things were you know getting not completely uh wasn't they were not completely right but no doctor and no friend and no family member had any insights into this so when you say collapsed what does that mean well i mean it was <coughs> dramatic i had i was working in venture capital and i was traveling a lot so i was going especially transatlantic flights so it was one transatlantic flight i was boarding the 
uh, SAS flight at Newark uh, and going to Stockholm. And sitting there at the airport, I was having a coffee with a friend who's a doctor. And I, I said, it's so strange. I, my, my, my feet are, are completely swollen. And uh, he's a very good doctor. And he said, well, that's, that's very strange. I mean, what, what's going on? I mean, are, are your kidneys okay? I said, yeah, everything is fine. And nothing had been bad or, or because I hadn't tested it, it, it either. I think I had avoided those kind of tests. Uh, but I boarded the flight. And um, uh, when, I, when I got off in, uh, in Stockholm, I was in very bad shape. I mean, I was in cold sweat. I was uh, in uh, my my legs were now completely swollen as well. And I, I took a cab back home and uh, or to to uh, to my apartment. And the next day, and because uh, I was living in Stockholm for two years between 2005 and 2007, and um, I uh, next day at work, I I left my uh, office and went directly to the emergency room. I went to to the hospital, and I uh, my blood pressure was incredibly high 220 over 180 uh, i had massive proteinuria so my kidneys were They're failing t- total failure uh, my eyes i had macular edema on both eyes um, my my vision was so blurred because of this uh, edema in the back of my eye my hemoglobin had gone down to six because my kidneys were not producing erythropoietin because they were in such bad shape it was a total catastrophe. Your body was falling apart. My body was literally falling apart. I mean, I, I was a walking stroke risk. Um, and uh, the, they, they actually thought at the Karolinska Hospital that I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because of, of, of this total body uh, crisis. And I was admitted and I was in the hospital and they did all these exams. Um, and finally, they just realized that I had uh, it was diabetes, diabetic complications. And I was put on a lot of medication. I mean, five different antihypertensives. I was giving, uh, given uh, blood transfusions. And this uh, is all about the age of 34. Yeah, yeah. So I, before I turned 35, I, I was in, in total, total crisis, yeah. So did they, there, was, there was probably at that point um, a, a significant decision for you to make from a number of different perspectives, not only from how you're taking care of yourself, but your kidneys are failing at this point. So they're probably giving you a choice of, of, of dialysis at this point? No, no, no. They, uh, I wasn't that bad. I mean, it was acute failure. Uh, okay. And they, they, I mean, they, they probably, I didn't take that in at all. I, I just saw this as now I'm, I need to change. I need to really take care of myself. But uh, I, for some reason, and maybe this has to do with human uh, just defense mechanism, I didn't see that I would ever go on dialysis at that time. I just th- thought now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stabilize and I'm going to get better. Um, I, when I have been sick, I have always thought about very small next steps. So I've thought about, okay, so when, when they told me this, I said, okay, so now I need to get a little better. And I, I need to I need to make a few changes. Um, and uh, so the first change was that now I needed to tell people I had diabetes. Yeah, there's no way to hide it anymore. There was no way of hiding it. So I remember how my my boss, so the the head of the venture fund where I was a partner, he came to my house and he said, "Well, no one knew you had diabetes, and you're in terrible shape." I said, "Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I didn't didn't let anyone in on it. That's why my my insurance was higher than anyone else's, and I'd made up some story that I had a back problem." But uh, uh, so um, so that was the first thing, and then I realized that um, I, I I didn't want to just work in healthcare finance anymore. I wanted to work in diabetes. I wanted to find a job where I could really use my experience in diabetes and and come up with better ways of treating the disease, which was my original plan. Uh, but then I had deviated a, a away and worked more in healthcare sure. in general. So I, um, um, I I I took actually it was probably three months that I took off, which was the first time in my life really I'd hardly taken a vacation before. I took off and I tried to get back in shape and my body repaired to a certain extent so my kidney function was down to 30 percent which is still manageable and um, my a1c was down my my eyes had been treated extensively with laser and uh, avastin at the time so um, i had been treated so much in my eyes that my retinas are so burnt that i only have essentially like the pin of a needle left but I could see perfectly, you know, with that little left of the, the tissue in the back of the eye. 
so I can see, I can't see very well peripherally, um, and I can't see well in the dark. It's a problem with the vision in the dark and problem with the light, but I'm very happy with my vision uh, under the circumstances. And I, <laughs> as my mother would say, now when I got better, uh, she calls me her, her little soldier because, again, I put on my boots and I went out and I said, now I'm going to get a job in diabetes. So I went to um, Johnson & Johnson and Medtronic and Novartis and I said, I want to work in diabetes. And and they were very eager to do. I was you know relatively young, but I had a good experience and, um, and uh, wanted to take on this job in industry where I had come from venture and... Uh, and um, uh, biotech and uh, and um, uh, working in in finance, so they saw that as a uh, be an interesting addition to a team. So I joined um, uh, J and J as the head of metabolic strategy, which was very very interesting. And um, uh, I obviously told people I have diabetes, but I didn't tell them I had all the complications. Sure. Um, because that's not a good way of entering into any job and saying I'm you know in in chronic kidney disease stage in any way. three yeah. and I you know I have all these different issues so I uh, uh, started to to do that and enjoyed it very much where I now could be open in a meeting and say you know I as a person with diabetes I think that we should move in this way and but I was very careful with it because I, th I still think and I still think it is very important as anyone who's afflicted with any disease you can't use your n of one to make decisions for a um, about a product, you have to really make sure that your uh, situation is also uh, repeated or applicable to a larger group of people. Of course, of but course. I can definitely understand what it's like to live with the disease, and I can, I can, I could better, uh, I think, identify with the with our market uh, with the population. Sure. So all of your worlds are kind of coming together again into this very important role that you're fulfilling within. This, within the, the healthcare medical diabetes space. And just kind of circling back to, to the, the kidney issue, you, your dad ended up playing a very important role in your life again yeah. um, at some point. Maybe you can share just a little bit about... Yeah, so two years later, that. so this was 2007 uh, that everything broke down. Uh, and it was really, I mean, it was tough. I, I, I think I don't remember it. I think my mother probably remembers it better or the people around me because it was really a, a tough, uh, I would say, six to 12 months where, where things just continued to break down. It was, you know, went from the kidneys and the eyes and and my blood pressure and uh, the risk of stroke uh, to uh, having suddenly problems with my teeth. I had never had a cavity and suddenly my... It was just, a, and I had infections, I had meningitis, I had tonsillitis again. My body was in, in a total weak position. And um, I, think, I think it was probably everything else that had happened afterwards, this was probably the moment where I was at the closest of not making it. Because it was just so much that, that really w collapsed. Um, and I, I was very fortunate to have help. But but so I got back and I took this job with J&J &J and I was back in New York and I was driving back and forth to, to Johnson & Johnson. And I thought I was um, managing. But within um, a year and a half, I was, um, I, 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 I felt, I knew I wasn't feeling really well. I was, I was weak again. I was weak, I was tired, more tired than I should have been. And I was sitting at, uh, in January in San Francisco, with a very good friend of mine, um, and he's a nephrologist, but he works in finance. And he said, well, you really look gray. You don't look very good, and you look puffy, and what, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, my nephrologist says it's uh, it's okay. And he said, well, what's your creatinine? And I mentioned the, the number, and he said, but you really have to get another nephrologist because that number is in very, very bad. And I knew that, but I wasn't, you know, taking it in fully. Uh, so as soon as I got back to New York from San Francisco, I, uh, I um, called another nephrologist um, in a kidney doctor at uh, Columbia Presbyterian, got an appointment the next week and um, met a whole team, the nephrologist, the transplant surgeon, the uh, social worker, the psychologist, everyone it was a whole day um, because my numbers were so bad that they had set me up for a for evaluation for a transplant. They said if you don't get a transplant, you will need dialysis within a few months. 
so um, I called my parents from from the hospital, and um, they my father said, "But it's because you're not taking care of yourself. You're 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 not prioritizing your health again. If you were just taking care of yourself, those numbers would be reversed." I said, "No, I'm sorry, but I, I, they tell me I need a, a transplant." And he said, "I don't believe that." So that was his first reaction. And then the next day, he calls me back. I said, "I spoke to someone who." checked your numbers and he told me that you're right so when are we doing the transplant and i uh, so he said when are we doing the transplant?" yeah he said i, I mean i'm doing it. he actually to, to give him even more credit uh this was in january and in december i had been uh I, we, we 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 took a walk he and i on the beach where they live in connecticut and uh, with my two little dogs and he said you know you don't look very good i think something is wrong and and I think your kidneys are, are not in good shape. So if if you need a kidney, you know that I will give you a kidney. Wow. So he, he, he preempted this whole thing. And then I ended up going to, where did I go? Panama for New Year's with, with a friend. And, you know, in a terrible trip to take when you're in kidney failure. So I was always doing these things that were against uh, the advice of any medical professional. And I'm supposed to be one. But uh, anyway, so so he said the following day, when are we doing it? I said, well, they told me that uh, you need to be evaluated. I mean, at the time he was 62. Um, so um, he was above 60, which means you have to be even more evaluated. Um, so he came in to, uh, to New York from Connecticut and did all the tests and we were compatible. And he was strong enough and uh, healthy enough. So we, we did the transplant just um, less than uh, about six weeks later. Wow. Um, what a gift your dad just gave you. Yeah. 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 Now he was, uh, he's my hero. I mean, together with my mother, because it wasn't easy for her either. Yeah. Uh, and my sisters, because, uh, and everyone around me, I mean, they were, they were, it was remarkable how people came together. Really remarkable. So ultimately, not only do you receive this gift from your dad, this kidney, um, but you, at some point, shortly thereafter, you end up receiving Probably uh, if someone is impacted by type 1 diabetes, it seems like even a, a larger gift to a certain extent is the ability to have a new pancreas. Yeah. And, so uh, you have to understand, I was in terrible shape. I mean, when I, when I showed up at Columbia and, and when I showed up at Karolinska in 2007, I was a candidate for a pancreas transplant because I had such complications and I was in such brittle state. I mean, the hypoglycemic episodes that I had, uh, you know, rendered me, uh, you know, unconscious. Uh, it, it made me a liability driving. Uh, my mother, uh, my loved ones would, would fear that I would die in my sleep. I mean, the, the concept of dead in bed was something that uh, was uh, every day for me because I was getting very unaware. Um, and um, uh, so when I showed up at um, uh, Columbia for my evaluation of a kidney transplant, they immediately said you should also consider a pancreas because not only will the pancreas prevent further damage to your new kidney and eyes that are already in such bad shape, but, but it will also render you insulin independent if, if things go well. Uh, so you should consider that. And I, I said, so what does that require? Well, it's a major surgery, but uh, no difference in the treatment. So the drug regimen that I would need to have uh, take on for the rest of my life, the immunosuppressive mm -hmm. therapy, would be exactly the same. Uh, so I wouldn't have to change. So therefore, I looked at it and I, I, I said, well, that is a huge opportunity if, if everything goes well. And for some reason, despite everything that had gone wrong, I didn't see that it wouldn't go well. I had, I had this curious uh, optimism uh, or maybe this view again of taking risk has never been a problem for me in the sense that it's my, my own life that I'm betting. I mean, I'm, if it's myself, I, I can take a lot of risk. If it is something else, it's more difficult. But I, I saw this as I was pretty confident that it would go well. I don't know why. So I, I looked into it and I saw, well, they hadn't done many at Columbia. They'd done two at the time. The doctor who proposed this to me was a very strong doctor, but he'd only done two. So I said to him, you know, I may have to look at some other places as well. And uh, uh, since I was working in the space, I knew that David Sutherland in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, had done 
one of the first ones, 1973, and he had been doing them ever since and done more than a thousand at this time. So I scheduled a trip to Minneapolis and met with him and the team and they evaluated me as well. And they also found me eligible for a pancreas transplant uh, like they had at Columbia with no question. And they said you could either do pancreas full organ or you could do islet cell transplant, which was also available. Bernard Herring at, uh, at uh, Minneapolis is the leader there and David Sutherland very much said, you know, you could choose. Uh, the islet transplant is very minimally invasive versus pancreas transplant is a full organ transplant. Sure. Um, and I looked at the uh, outcomes and uh, I said, well, if I'm going to go through this, I, I prefer going for the full organ because it seems like it's a higher success rate. He said, well, it's big surgery. And I said, yeah, but I'm not afraid of the surgery. So you want uh, the outcomes. That's I what want the outcomes. For. And yeah. I also saw this man, uh, you know, I think you want people to be humble and you want people to to be, uh, you know, good with patients. But when you go to a surgeon, you want him, at least I want him to be somewhat arrogant and very confident. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, you know, that's what this guy was. He said, I can do it and it, you're going to be fine. Um, uh, he also happened to be an MD, PhD in immunology. So he, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, so so um, uh, I got the call in... Um, uh, actually, on, on New Year's Eve, uh, the day before New Year's Eve of 2009, so nine months after the uh, kidney transplant, and I flew to, to Minnesota or Minneapolis uh, immediately after the call, and um, I was on the table New Year's Eve of uh, 2009, and uh, David Sutherland walked in and said, uh, we can't do it tonight. I said, okay, so I've flown to Minneapolis. It's minus 40 degrees. It's on New Year's Eve, and I've been waiting for this now, and you can't do it. So why can't you do it? Well, the pancreas that was uh, the one that was going to be for you, it does not look good. Because that's the final step. You know, it has to be matched. It has to, you know, all these different criteria. And then when it actually is in the hand of the surgeon, it l has to physically look good. And sure. he said, we, we can't use this pancreas for you. It's not, it's not in good shape. So I said, okay. So I got dressed and I went back to the hotel. And uh, I think I actually went out to have dinner because uh, it was New Year's Eve and then went back to sleep. And then the next day they said, okay, I'll stay because I'm now number one on the list and let's give it one more day. So I went out to lunch in uh, Minneapolis and I got another call. And it was, this time, uh, it was uh, a good pancreas. What an amazing emotional roller coaster! Oh, it was horrible, horrible. I mean, horrible. I was, you know, on the, you know, being, being rolled into the OR, and 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 there he is with his cap on and everything, and he says, "It can't do it." Yeah, tonight. everything's ready to go, and then all of this, all of a sudden, it's just screeching halt for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it ended up working out the next day, which is amazing because that means that it was meant to be at that point in time for you. Yeah. So, so you, you go from, from a, a very diseased state to a, a point where you receive a new kidney, a new pancreas, we all within the course of less than 12 months. Now, aside from the obvious health, health benefits that you've gained, you gained immediately from that, or as it gradually got better over time, which I'm sure there's no immediate, there's an immediate benefit, but it's not all of a sudden your health is just perfect at no, once. No, no, it took time. Um, how did that change your view on the world? And oh, of life in general. Changed it dramatically. I mean, I would say the kidney saved my life and it was incredible. But the, w the pancreas made my life so much more worth living. And I mean, it's horrible to say that because especially with people who have type 1 diabetes, it's of course worth living. I would never say anything uh, differently. But what, what, it, what it gave me was an ability or a chance to understand how bad I had lived before. Because with the pancreas, how I felt, I realized that I had felt very, very poorly for a long period of time. And I had just grown accustomed to it. That yeah. was what I felt was normal. You know, the, the feeling of your skin being too tight, the feeling of fear when your blood sugar goes low, the uh, feeling of irritability and headaches and, and the, 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 the fear of uh, complications and, and the constant management of, of uh, insulin injections versus blood sugar measurements and the food intake and the, the stress it all puts on you. All that was suddenly gone. 
But you know, now it's 2007 in October, and I, I still, when I leave the house to go to dinner, I still check if I bring my, if I have my pen with me. You know, so it's so ingrained in me. It's especially when I, when I go on a trip, and I think, did I pack enough insulin? Did I pack enough blood sugar strips? And I don't pack any of that. I mean, I have to pack my pills, but. You know that life of living with living as a as a person with diabetes, it it really impacts you so much. So it it gave me an opportunity uh, to to see uh, what it's like to be a diabetic. You know, in some ways, very strange because now I'm no longer living with the symptoms of diabetes. But it was not until I I'm living without the symptoms of diabetes that I realized how hard it was to live as a diabetic. Yeah. Um, and that was the biggest insight. The other one was that I really need to work much harder than I have ever before to make this available for, for not, not pancreas transplant, but to make this life available for everyone who's living with this disease. Yeah, and I want to definitely dive into what your work, what you're doing now, because that's really, really important. Uh, j- just as an aside, do you still play tennis? I do, I do. But um, I don't enjoy it so much. <laughs> You know, I, I, I used to play so well, and I'm not so good anymore. And now when I play, it's just, it makes me so angry. I mean, I'm, I'm such a bad right now on the, on the court. I will throw my racket. I will get very upset because it, it's so frustrating that I can't play so well. So I think I need to get over that hump and get back because now I'm stronger. I mean, stronger again, because it did take time for me to get back from these surgeries and you know, I had one more little uh, issue uh, two years ago, and I. So I, I, I think that, and now that I'm getting stronger, and and I'm realizing that maybe, now that I'm growing older, maybe I'm realizing I don't need to win. I don't need to be uh, constantly so good at it. Um, it may, I may appreciate it more, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to play more again. I think it's hard to break that cycle of wanting to be the best at something, though. It seems like that's been with you since that original video that you watched when you were two years old trying to beat all of your friends in a race oh yeah 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 <laughs> so so what i what i love about your story and and we've had a chance to talk uh, a couple of times um is that you've taken all of this this amazing story and all of these challenges that you faced throughout the course of your life and you've as you alluded to just a moment ago you, you're you've crafted something that is massively positive for so many people out there, not only in the diabetes world, but anyone who's dealing with certain chronic conditions. So all of your academic, your professional experiences, your personal experiences um, have come together to form as what I call this venture catalyst um, known as Lifebulb. Maybe you can describe a little bit about what Lifebulb is. And before you do that, I'm really curious to understand what served as the spark to start it now at this point in your life? Mm-hmm. Well, it's something that I've been thinking about for, for a longer period of time, but um, uh, it wasn't until I felt uh, strong enough physically and, and, and mentally that I, I could take the step. I mean, as you know, to go into something on your own and to leave a very stable environment, of uh, uh, especially if you have a chronic disease, uh, and to, to do your own thing, it requires... Um, uh, uh, risk taking and it requires feeling very confident that you can do it um, and that you have the right support. So I would say that uh, for me it took all that and and the uh, the timing was right because I had two fantastic friends and colleagues um, and I we had been talking about the idea of embracing the patient and really leveraging the experiences of the patient when it comes to stimulating innovation in chronic disease. So we say that we want to bridge patient communities with industry and capital, and we do that really through uh, the concept of patient entrepreneurs. And the patient entrepreneur is something that is the opposite of being patient. These individuals are the most impatient entrepreneurs you can ever meet. And they take their passion in scientific discovery or technology discovery and you know finding a market and and really accelerating all that passion with that of their own experience either being a patient or being directly related to someone who or someone who is living with chronic disease so they have not only identified a need 
a problem, but they're also trying to solve that need and that problem. And to me, it is not just about diabetes. It's about all chronic disease. It's about diseases that are progressive, they're debilitating, there's no cure, and diseases that affect everything in life, and everything in life affect those diseases. So, you know, diabetes being the lead, since it's the one we know the, the, the most, and the one that I'm experiencing, uh, have been experiencing, and am still experiencing. But the same goes for Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, you know, cancer being a chronic disease now, um, uh, chronic kidney disease, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, all these diseases have those common really um, definitions of, of um, uh, what I just mentioned. So there we want to identify individuals who are patient entrepreneurs, we want to help them build their businesses, and we want to leverage the power of pharma and capital and, you know, insurance companies, everyone who is involved in the healthcare system uh, that can really benefit from better products being on the market and, and also to get closer to their clients. I mean, the client, the customer of the healthcare industry is the patient, is the family that supports the patient. And I think that we've been saying that we are all patient-centric uh, over the past, I would say, 10, 15 years in this industry. But I want to take it one step further. We're not just patient-centric, but we want to be working side by side. It's the um, industry that serves the patient should be working side by side with the patients in coming up with solutions. And that's really what Life Bulb is about. Was there a, a granted, in, uh, basically an entrepreneurial, in the entrepreneurial world, entrepreneurs by definition are known as groundbreakers. They're people who are creating things that have never been created before. But in this particular case, was there a model that you looked to to develop Life Bulb? No, not really. We, we, we saw, I mean, it's a, it's a mix of so many different things. Yeah. I mean, we are a community. We are, you know, inspiration, motivation when it comes to uh, how we try to position ourselves. And so here we have models that are, uh, you know, patients like me. We have, uh, you know, disease organizations such as JDRF, ADA, you know, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And, um, um, and then we also want to be incredibly strong in um, identifying businesses such as the best venture capitalist, like an Orbimed, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, any, any venture capital or organization. And then we also want to work with products. We want to bring products to market. So, you know, you think about these uh, companies that are Johnson & Johnson is a great company in, 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 in life sciences. I mean, they're also in, consumer, uh, in the consumer business. They're in uh, the device business. You know, Nova Nordisk, our collaborator in diabetes, I think they're a fantastic company focusing on science and bringing better products to market. So, you know, but then, you know, I'm also looking at personalities. I mean, think about uh, people who are educators, people who are raising awareness. I mean, they're fantastic examples of, of individuals who are bringing a movement. Um, and I think that in some ways we want LifeBulb to be a movement that people want to be part of. Uh, that's the ultimate uh, goal for us is to uh, impact quality of life and removing the burden of disease. And that we can do in different ways. I mean, one being investing in innovation, the other one being partnering with big companies, but also by actually making people change behavior. And I think that's part of what we want to do through our blog, through our, you know, our message in, in various different ways and impacting people uh, on a personal level. We've also done many, many events in New York, and these events have been, you know, live events, uh, but we'd like to do them maybe online as well. We've done tweet chats and uh, we'll do more webinars and things like that so that people can access us. I mean, we're getting requests from all people from countries all over the world uh, who'd like to be part of this. And uh, that's where we need to work even harder to make it global. Yeah. I'm going to, in the show notes to this particular episode, I'm going to make sure that everybody has a link to the Lifebulb website so they can sign up for any information they might want to get. They can reach Fantastic. out to you to get information. If there's patient entrepreneurs or potential patient entrepreneurs out there, no matter what the idea might be, I'm sure you're willing to hear what, what people have uh, to bring to the table because the, the most amazing ideas come from the, the, the most interesting of places. And so uh, I'll make sure I have all that information uh, dialed in on the show notes. Now, now, in just about one week from today, which is uh, the day we're recording this particular interview, 
Um, you're going to be heading over to Denmark and working with one of your, uh, the partners that you just described just a moment ago, Novo Nordisk. And you're going to be going over there with a group of patient entrepreneurs who've gone through an entire process to become the select group for the 2017 Lifebulb Novo Nordisk Innovation Summit. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the summit's about, how that came to be, and really what the goals are uh, coming out of that summit. Yeah, no, this is a, is a great partnership. And uh, we started last year uh, together with Nova Nordisk in uh, doing the first ever Patient Entrepreneur Summit and Award. And it's in the area of diabetes. It's um, a better management of diabetes using uh, devices, consumer products, and healthcare IT. Uh, so we have now uh, selected 12 individuals representing 12 companies. They have to be CEO or founder or you know really a, a leader within the, uh, the company. Um, they have to have a connection to diabetes, either being a patient or uh, b having a loved one with uh, diabetes or a relative. And uh, their product or solution needs to really be uh, developed because of that uh, connection. So we um, have together with um, a committee based on uh, based of uh, Novo and Lifebulb picked out of close to 100 applications from 25 countries. Uh, these 12, and they will go together with us, the team from Lifebulb, the team and a big team from Nova Nordisk, and a group of venture capitalists are coming to uh, Copenhagen starting Monday next week. And for three days, they will be interacting um, and importantly, pitching their concepts to an international specialized jury who will pick three and will name those three and they will be given monetary awards and obviously recognition and networking. And over those three days, not only will they be pitching their, their uh, companies, but they will also be working in uh, small teams with mixed, with Novo, with the venture capitalists and so on, and trying to find solutions and trying to you know, work together in, uh, in uh, showing how they solve problems and Novo will see what kind of capabilities they can add to these uh, individuals. And that's really the goal for us. The first step was to um, do the award and to show the recognition and really showcase these individuals. But the next step is to find ways to help them over the year in between the awards as well so that we can develop mentorship programs we can develop essentially like a virtual incubator where we can really help uh, these uh, people with contacts with access to capital uh, capabilities and obviously uh, uh, better networking this is a super unique opportunity for any entrepreneur uh, because if things like this existed across category, just think of the amazing innovations that would actually, forget about the ideas, but it would actually be in front of us right now. Yep. Um, so this is, this is super unique and I'm really excited to hear the outcomes of, of the, uh, the, uh, the awards and, and the companies that are actually um, the recipients uh, uh, that you guys felt were uh, worthy of those awards. They're all worthy of being there clearly. Absolutely. Um, and ultimately it, it's, it's hopeful that all of them will do something amazing with their technology and their ideas. Um, you mentioned that last year, and I'm gonna, we're going to finish up in just a couple of minutes. I know you have to run to, to a meeting probably at this point, so I want to be respectful of that too. But you mentioned last year was the first time that you had the Innovation Awards. If you can kind of name one or two technologies, and I, I know it's kind of like saying this is your favorite baby. I don't want to yeah. say that at all. But is there one that sticks out in your mind that kind of that, that says, yeah, this was definitely without a doubt one of the ones that we were going to pick to be part of the, uh, the, uh, the process last year? You know, I don't want to mention one. I think uh, they're all great. And um, uh, if, we, if you look at the 10 who um, were picked last year, they've all done really well after that. I mean, one of them was sold uh, to a bigger company. Um, one raised 27 million in uh, a Series C financing. Uh, one is about to close on his financing of $3 million. Uh, one is about to go out and raise money. Uh, one was elected into an incubator. Uh, one launched his product in across the world. Um, you know, they've, they've all done incredibly well. So uh, I, I think it's unfair to mention any one of them, but uh, if you take a look at our website and you look at the patient entrepreneurs of 2016, you will recognize uh, uh, some of the names and some of them I'm sure you will learn much more about. But, but that says a lot about your process. The fact that all of them have actually 
created yeah. something where they're that they're moving along that path, which that's a very, very difficult path for any startup to go down. So that says a lot about the process and what Lifebulb is actually doing. So thank you for putting that together. Um, so final questions, um, and just for everybody who's listening, I'm going to make sure that, uh, life bulbs information, your social media contact information, how to learn more about the innovation summit. That's all on the, on the website so they can get in touch with you guys. Um, last question for you in, in your opinion, because you've been through a lot in life, what is your definition of the word brave? Uh, for me, brave is never giving up. It's easy to give up. And I think being brave means that you continue to fight. Well, you're definitely a fighter. <laughs> and we all appreciate that. So this has been, been an amazing conversation for me. Um, your personal strength and, and unwavering dedication to helping the world to create solutions, which is key. It's to create solutions, to live healthier lives. Despite a diagnosis is beyond inspiring for me personally. And I know everyone listening would agree with me. So I'm excited to hear the outcomes of this year's summit and to follow up on all the amazing things that are coming out of the life bulb ecosystem as time goes forward. I'm honored to know you. And I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great. All right. We'll talk soon. All right, guys, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Heenberger and be sure to check her and life bulb out online as well as follow their story on social media. And as always, I'll make sure to put up all of those links to everything we talked about in the show today on the show notes for this episode. So head on over to thebravestlife.com forward slash 020 for all that information and much, much more. Again, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have taken the time to reach out through email and social media. Your stories and your feedback are truly fuel for what I'm doing with the podcast and all of the other projects I have bubbling up in the background. So please keep the wonderful feedback coming. It definitely means the world to me. Okay, guys, I'm Craig, and we will catch you next time on The Bravest Podcast.